John, what is the BBC Media Action? Well, BBC Media Action is an INGO that's very closely associated with the BBC. Um, so we are a charity with an international focus, but with a registration in the UK, and we work on um, health communication, uh, journalistic training. Uh, we do governance programming, which for the uninitiated is, is essentially helping people get involved in political participation. Uh, often in polities where they haven't had the opportunity to do so or um, fragile states. Um, and lastly, we do work on resilience, by which we mean the ability to respond to disasters and communications disasters. So, for example, we're currently doing a lot of work in Nepal, and we've, we're, we're in the process of finishing a considerable body, body of work in w the West African countries affected by Ebola, um, primarily communicating key... Uh, messages to individuals so they can safeguard their health or get the help they need. Okay, well let's let's um, let's first of all talk a bit about Cambodia. Yes, so so our work in, in Cambodia is aimed at young people, uh, so sort of the sort of 14 to 25 year old demographic. Um, Cambodia has a, a, a disproportionately young population. Uh, so the, the most prominent piece of work we do in Cambodia is a, a radio show and television drama series, both with the same uh, uh, title of, of Love Nine, which deal primarily with sexual health and, reputa um, and excuse me, reputational issues, um, uh, relationship issues. Prior to that, uh, we did a, a piece of work called Loy Nine, which doesn't translate terribly well, but it sort of means cool, lucky number, as it were, um, I'm told. Uh, which it was primarily about young people's participation in, in governance processes, particularly at a local level. And again, that was driven primarily through the media of television drama. So we work uh, uh, development messages into an ongoing soap opera, as it were. Um, were you invited there by the by the government? How, how did that yeah, come good, about? I mean, that's a good question. Um, in, 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 in Cambodia, we were invited there primarily by our donors, including uh, a couple of UN bodies. Now, the way in which you, you set up in countries varies quite considerably, and that's an area of, of complexity um, you probably don't want me to get into here. Um, typically, we decide we want to do a piece of work, and then you apply for permission. There are countries w which are exceptions to that where they will, we might be invited in. And, and, and for us, probably the most obvious example, most, most, most obvious and most prominent example is our work in Burma or Myanmar, if, if you prefer, where the government invited us in. And we work with the state broadcaster, MRTV. Um, what, what sort of um, problems does this present from the... Uh, from the BBC standpoint, because you're, you're working in countries, I mean, particularly a country like Myanmar, where um, the, 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 you might be seen as legitimizing a, a yeah. regime. I mean, and this, this, and, and this is where we get onto the first sort of, if you like, ethical component of this, of the Q, it's Q and A. Although the BBC, with which we work very closely and have to observe a lot of BBC rules, uh, and a lot of our judgments are driven by BBC editorial judgments and compliance sees it in terms of editorial judgment primarily rather than strictly ethics. But there are, to my mind, ethical issues w within that. Um, so the, there are a number of problems can be posed, particularly when you're working with a government, it can, it can apply to donor organizations as well, but when you're working with a government that has particular, a particular agenda for communication, some parts of which we wouldn't want to endorse necessarily, and we would like to generally preserve uh, an editorial balance whilst communicating some, some of the messaging, which, which we, in some which we would entirely endorse. Um, if we can just skip from, across, from Burma to India for a second, for example, we work quite closely with the Indian government uh, on, a, on a very large uh, couple of health projects. Um, training frontline health workers and midwives. Now, the Indian government also incentivizes, incentivizes some of those same frontline health workers and midwives to offer sterilizations. Um, we, we certainly wouldn't want to in, be, in, they're not forced sterilizations to be absolutely clear, but you know, there's, there's an incentive scheme there, which is something we're not 
in the, in the business of messaging around, but we're still working with both those staff and the, the government. Um, so that my, my, is a clear case where we've got a clear message we're communicating and we wouldn't want to have that blurred by that necessary government involvement. And you can't work in, in health on the scale, certainly on the scale we do in India, um, without working very closely with government. Um, going back to Burma, the, uh, our work with the Burmese government is, is much, less, um, uh, it, much less sensitive from the point of view of messaging we're putting across. We're primarily working with the uh, state broadcaster to build its capacity to step into, if you like, a public service broadcasting shoes. So the, I think the, uh, the key ethical implication is to what extent is one endorsing a regime that y you might, on the, gr on, the, on the grounds of democratic values, find questionable. That said, I'd say, and this is a, this is a personal view, certainly not a view of the organization I work for, and I'm not expressing a view f on their behalf, I, I find it really exciting that they ha are opening up to the extent that they let us into the country and start training um, hitherto essentially a propaganda channel um, or in, in journalistic techniques and at least the beginnings of a journalistic approach to broadcast. I, I think I'm going to um, open it up to, um, to a few questions. That's a good question, um, and to, to cut, to, I'll, to, I'll cut to the last bit of the question, um, at, in, in aspect, so, so, and I'd, I'd say we say no a lot, a very great deal of the time, and actually I think most INGOs that are primarily grant funded and are well run probably ought to say no an awful lot of the time. We probably say, I think uh, the proportion to which we say no is, is, greater than, is, is greater than most even given that. Um, so multiple complexities, and to a certain extent, some of it depends on which uh, part of the stream the partner, the partner is. So, so different, slightly different considerations apply to donors, to governments with which we'll work, and to uh, partners that may, as it were, sit downstream of us, e that either we fund in the course of a project or we'll work with closely, and there'll be a more, a more junior partner, perhaps. It, sometimes those aren't funded relationships. Uh, candidly, the, the questions when it comes to governments tend to be more around how closely do we, firstly, how closely are we going to be working with them, how closely associated are we going to be with them, and secondly, are they going to tolerate our presence, and what are the risks around um, being allowed to operate in the first place, or possibly being kicked out, because being kicked out of a country is a risk, and it is considerable risk in some, in some countries. Uh, with with donors, well, actually, candidly, we tend to be happy to work with most major funding organizations, and we've got an ongoing relationship with most, well, quite a few, um, certainly, the mo certainly all, most of the major national and quite a few of the transnational funding bodies. There are a few exceptions of people we don't work with, but that's not primary. It tends to be around their priorities rather than ethical issues. Um, the, there may be, from time to time, there may be some exceptions to that, but that's, that's, that's relatively, relatively normal. With, with partners, um, typically more junior partners, so that we tend to be most concerned with, well, are there internal processes and controls, and that includes financial controls, um, uh, are they adequate for the purposes which are working with them? And then the association um, element comes in, particularly when it comes into, when it, particularly when it comes to dealing with local broadcasters. So, for example, we work with uh, around 130 radio stations in Nigeria. Uh, now, most of that, most of those relationships are relatively thin, and we provide them with content, and they agree to broadcast it. We do do an assessment process with those partners with the aim of not being associated with extremist speech, speech what one might call in, a, in, a, in, a, in an occidental context sort of hate speech. Um, but we, you know, we work with religious broadcasters, not just in Nigeria, but in, in multiples Africa, who 
whose uh, prevailing views on certain uh, freedom topics, as, as it were, wouldn't be considered norm, normal or acceptable in, in the West. The, we, 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 what we don't want to have is our content going on and straight after that there's an imam saying something quite damaging to a, to a, to a sub, subgroup in that country, say. Not, not just an imam, could, could easily be a pastor, just for balance here. Um, there's a question at the back, yes. Well, I, I'm not going to comment too much on the specifics of what's happening with the BBC, if that's okay. Um, and and it's, it's worth saying that that might have some implications for us in terms of some of the people we work with. So, it, you know, it might be that some of the people I work with support staff, as it were, not frontline program makers, might, that they might find themselves moved to different roles or um, positions might disappear. So th th there will be some of that, some of that will have some minor implications for us, I suspect. What is very interesting, I think, in, in, terms, in, in, in terms of uh, what the BBC has meant and the, uh, our work, particularly when we work with state broadcasters, and I have particularly in mind MRTV in, in Burma and uh, RTA in Afghanistan, in that in, if the BBC's uh, position as the paradigm of public service broadcast, and there are many people who believe the BBC is the very best there is in that respect, um, is, uh, is open to question. And I would say that it's, it's, in terms of its provision, it's, it's vastly more expansive in terms of its provision of entertainment than the would-be public service broadcasters we tend to work with. Uh, does that have any implications for the model which we start from when we work with those state, state and public service broadcasters? Um, so so uh, I, I know I haven't, haven't, hope, hope you haven't completely dodged the question there. Um, it does have implications. Uh, and, but, it, but it, I don't know how those will be received internationally, to be candid, because the way the BBC is seen in different countries is radically different to the way it's seen in the UK um, in, in, in many different ways. Y yes, I mean, that, that's an interesting question. Pr primarily, uh, we uh, do research both for what we call formative research, forgive me if I'm, if I'm using terms that are, dis are dissonant to an academic audience, um, but uh, we do what we call formative research in designed to identify how best to go about building programming. And that can take the form of very different um, means of communication. So we don't do much of this, but we do everything from, if you like, puppet shows and uh, small drama groups that roam uh, rural, rural areas to, in, uh, at the higher end, and it's, this is relatively unusual for us now, um, relatively glossy drama productions over a long period of time with significant size sets and ongoing um, uh, plot lines. And then once we've, once we've broadcast, we then test the effectiveness of that programming against various metrics. Um, and, and that does raise, it's always going to raise the question about, well, you're promoting a message, but also the, trying to uh, keep ourselves to just pr the provision of information and yet evaluating the success. So there is a, there's a bit of a tension there. And what I'd, I suggest that, and that we don't have the perfect solution for every place. And whenever we work on a new piece of work in, in a new country or in, or in some cases a, a different group in the same country, um, there are, there's more to be learned. As it were. So yeah. to, to, to pick up that point about um, what, what sort of evidence is there that there's, uh, because I, obviously you, you, you're, you're holding yourself to account perhaps better than, um, than you might be held. Well, well yes, and actually just, just to, to pick on an underlying assumption there, the, uh, some donors will take their own and uh, will appoint their own evaluators for our work. Some donors will rely on us to uh, undertake an evaluation internally or sometimes with some external uh, input. And we have, we have a, cons a fairly 
chunky sized function which which is tasked with um, uh, uh, providing those evaluations um, and that tends to be the, the majority of, of what we do depending depending on the nature of, of the piece of work um, very of, very often uh, the metric will be uh, survey data from uh, intended beneficiaries uh, either both during the course of um, a run of a program and or at an end point. Um, sometimes, particularly with health programming, the metrics might, might be, particularly if it's health programming that could be located in specific areas, uh, we'll look at things like uh, an increase in attendance at a uh, an anti antenatal clinic and the like. And the like. So, so sometimes the metrics don't come from the people themselves, but I think the, probably the majority of that comes from, from survey data. Um, we also, uh, whereas we're primarily looking at outcomes, uh, we also measure audience numbers um, in terms of the number of people receiving programming for, for our work, which is easier, uh, far easier in some places than in others. Um. Any other questions? Yes. I'm reasonably happy to say that colonialism is a non-issue, except perhaps in the minds of people with perhaps vested interests in some policies um, who might, might, might want to uh, portray, in, I think, well-meaning development actors, and I don't, think that, that I don't think we're unique in this respect, um, as in some way um, uh, patronizing. Uh, or the, the servants of, of wider interests. Uh, the BBC, whilst it has generally takes the view that it, it, has, it, it shouldn't be advocating a particular line, it is acceptable in terms of BBC editorial values too, and I'm not going to get the quote quite right here, um, but it is, it is acceptable to uh, propose underlying fundamental democratic values. So, so this, the first part of your statement, whilst I'm not speaking for the BBC, um, is, is, is the case according to the BBC, and therefore we can promote that as a value, or those as, as, as values. Um, the, uh, the latter, I think, is, well, I think it's candidly language that has, bears no relevance now. Um, the, uh, there, are, there are groups who dislike our presence from time to time in, in, in places uh, on the grounds of they don't like our influence or they don't like the health messaging or, or el other elements of, or even dem basic democratic messaging that we're, we're, we're involved in. Um, I tend to only get worried about those guys when they want to attack us, frank, frankly. Well, um, can we just pick up on that point then? Um, there's uh, a number of state broadcasters where um, you know, at different points in time, they're subject to different um, external pressures, mm. but politi um, in particular political um, pressures and, and, and sometimes um, fr from armed forces or armed groups. Perhaps you can respond to that. Yes, um, so, so, so that's very apparent, uh, and the, it works its way through in very different ways in different places. Now, I'm, I'm no expert in this area, but it can vary from a anything from fairly gentle pressure uh, to not cover particular topics or to treat things more favorably to in some cases and certainly in the past where state broadcasters have just been dictated a line by the government and they're essentially the voice of the governing party. Um, on, uh, in fragile states, uh, and we have considerable sort of mainly second-hand experience of this um, uh, through partners, so rarely, they're rarely, we're rarely talking about state broadcasters here, or they may be state funded in some cases, it can involve some armed group turning up and threatening you with a gun in your face, and I mean that literally. Um, uh, killings rarer and not in our experience in, in the recent past, but, but, but the coercion and threat uh, varies considerably and it's very in some places it's extremely easy to issue issue threats uh, yes so, so, so but what I would suggest is most most partners and this includes state broadcasters are, are somewhere on a spectrum in terms of how free they feel to do the broadcasting they 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 want and they tend to be a 
acute judges of the risks involved in that, far better than we. Okay, we have um, time for one more question, I think. Well, I'm not familiar with Channel 4's work in, in Sri Lanka, um, so I'm afraid I can't comment on that. Um, and uh, w what we do is very explicitly development and media for development as opposed to media. Candidly, from the, um, those colleagues, because uh, I work with a lot of former um, Channel 4 people, former BBC people, um, uh, a lot of journalists by trade and program makers by trade, I get the impression that in commercial television and to a certain extent in public service broad news broadcast, the, the, in, the, the key incentive for people is to, is to find and tell interesting stories. Now, that certainly has in the past for some people meant not being, or being somewhat economical with the actuality and, and to provide more entertaining and interesting stories or to accentuate certain, uh, certain things. And the choice of a story, of course, is a normatively loaded um, matter. But I would suggest, just from what, what I've seen, that the incentives are much more about what, how can we make this exciting? Can we, can we get attention for ourselves as opposed to um, driven by an agenda that relates to the country which you're, you're reporting on when it comes to international news? I would suggest that there are probably exceptions to that. Um, Yes, I know that isn't, uh, finally that doesn't completely answer your question, but I, I'm not familiar with the piece you're talking about. All right. Okay, well, John, thank you very much. No, thank you.